In November 2010, a small town on the fringe of the famous Barossa Valley is the scene of the most gruesome multiple murders. People in Kapunda were scared. They were afraid that there was a killer in their midst and they wanted to know who it was, why it was. A family savagely murdered in their own home. I can tell you without word of a lie, I have never heard anything as bad as the Kapunda triple murder. There, there is simply no comparison. I mean, like, they were just good people. I just don't understand why someone would do this. Destroying a family one after the other in front of their eyes, in their own home. There's no greater evil than that. A town is left utterly stunned, whilst detectives struggle to find a motive. What we had here was just a tragedy of epic proportion. He's sitting there skinny, weedy and weak, and I just could not believe that this was the person that had perpetrated three murders. No emotion, no um, sorrow, no grief, no nothing. Uh, just a very um, cold, cold individual. As three people lie dead, the killer would be tracked down in one of the most unlikely places, making this a crime that shook Australia. Kapunda, 80 kilometers north of Adelaide, is a small town once home to a bustling mining community. Kapunda and the metal mine here is Australia's first commercial metal mine. It's now it's a tourist attraction. There are mines that you can still walk through, there are tours that you can go on, and to everybody else in South Australia, Kapunda is a low-level tourist destination. A little bit isolated as a result, and living that very stereotypical Aussie country life. You grow up with the group that you grow up with, you know them from birth through death, you take over a farm or you take over a business. On rare occasions, you actually get out of the town and do something else, but you've always got that tie back there. And the bonds that form in communities like Kapunda are lifelong, sometimes whether you like it or not. But the scene that is to unfold in Harriet Street on the morning of the 8th of November, 2010, is one that the quaint tourist town has never seen before. I was in my office going through a variety of files and uh, Senior Sergeant uh, Steve Kinsman came into the office and said that they had um, three bodies had been found in the house at Kapunda. Someone else had found the crime scene, they'd contacted the local police, and there's only two police officers in that town. One of them attended and saw the scene. He had an ambulance arrive. He entered the house with an ambulance officer to determine that all those people in the house were beyond help and that they were deceased. The biggest crime prior to this, as far as anyone was aware of, was that someone set fire to Map the Miner, which was a, a, a symbol there. An unprecedented scene confronted emergency services, as the three victims sadly could not be saved. I was hearing sporadic bits and pieces of information coming through from our investigative reporters, our police reporters, all of whom were trying to get information. What emerged very quickly was that police were keeping a very tight lid on the situation. They either knew completely what they were dealing with or had no idea whatsoever and were trying to keep things as tight as they possibly could while they sorted it out. It's fair to say that that crime scene was very confronting. There's been some criticism um, by the media on that day that I didn't declare that it was a, a triple murder. Well, to be honest, until you get in and have a really good look, that can be a big call to make. And if you're going to tell a community that three people have been murdered and you don't know who is responsible for it, you better be sure that that's what you're telling them. You don't want it to turn out that it was a murder-suicide later on. Information on the circumstances of the deaths was sporadic. But Grant Moyle and his colleagues needed to process the extent of the crime scene and uncover exactly what had happened. 
first and foremost, who have we got in the house? Who lives there? And who's died in that house at that particular time? Are there any outstanding people? Early information was the names of the people involved and that their son was away uh, in Queensland at that particular time. The three victims are eventually identified as Rose and Andrew Rowe and their 16-year-old daughter, Chantel. Their older son, Christopher, is on holiday on the Gold Coast. While Christopher and his fiancée were up there, news broke of the murders. Christopher saw in the news coverage his street, posted a message on Facebook, can somebody check on my parents? That's my street. And they're talking about people being killed there. He got a reply back very early in the piece saying, all's good. So he relaxed. But unfortunately, that was misinformation. That person had mistaken which house it was. And in their effort to help Christopher, they'd given him the wrong, the wrong information. Christopher then found out it was his parents and his sister. So of course, it went from being the dream holiday to the absolute nightmare. Obviously, we had to clarify exactly when he'd left and when we were satisfied that he certainly uh, couldn't be connected to this and try to get some background from him. Did he know uh, of any um, people who might be responsible for this? Were there any other issues with the family that we, that we weren't aware of? I was just absolutely devastated for the family because they were friends of mine. And then Christopher remains a very, very uh, dear friend and, and I'll support him as long as I can. And as the only surviving immediate relative tries to take in the news, the police search for a motive. What I will say is that yes, there was certainly a frenzied attack. Because of the nature of the scene, it was, I think it was a very personal attack. And so I don't think it was just someone random, but that doesn't allay community fears and certainly some fears from, from the beginning that was, um, did they have a murder on the loose in the town? The Rowe family moved to Kapunda just a few years earlier, with Andrew running his own carpet cleaning business, and by all accounts, had settled well into the community. Now viciously attacked in their home and left for dead, the police need to alleviate growing fears within the small town. I was just devastated, but then I had to take a deep breath and say, right, we've got, a, we've got something on our hands here that we've got to manage and make sure our people are, 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 are feeling safe. As more details started to emerge about Andrew Rose and Chantelle Rowe, questions started being asked and rumours started coming out. And they were, as is typical for Adelaide, unfortunate and unfair rumours. Some information was coming in about the family people were ringing up and that information had to be followed up, a variety of different lines of inquiry. And for example, there was Andrew owned a large motorcycle that looked like a Harley Davidson. So there was some speculation, was, is it bikey or drug related? Well, those things had to be ruled out. It wasn't even a Harley, so we ruled that out. But it took a, a number of um, hours to do that. There was a sense of, you know, uh, of angst in the town. I think there's no doubt about that. And like any smaller community, you're going to get the Chinese whispers and all of that. So that had to be managed also. Of course, then we were talking to the local police and um, the local, um, the neighbours, etc., to try to get some of that other information. That was done through door knocks of the area. As house-to-house -house inquiries begin and friends and relatives are questioned, an anonymous phone call is to reveal some alarming news. Some information came in through Crime Stoppers that a person had read a post on Facebook where a person had written that they had done something terrible, didn't know how they could live with themselves, they were very sorry, and, and, and words to that effect. And it, that person lived very close to this crime scene and also we could establish a connection with the family. And we thought, is this the man? Is he, um, is he confessing on Facebook?
Three members of a family have been brutally murdered in the rural town of Kapunda, South Australia. Rose, Andrew and Chantelle Rowe have suffered horrific injuries in a brutal and sustained attack. Now police have discovered a message on a social network site that could lead them straight to the killer. A person had written that they had done something terrible, didn't know how they could live with themselves. Also, we could establish a connection with the family. And we thought, is this the man? Is he confessing on Facebook? So we very quickly then had to gather the troops. Officers raced to question the man about his message on the social networking site. We were all hoping that this was the answer, but you're never that lucky. As it turned out, yes, we did have a team go to the house he was spoken to, and it was clear that what he was talking about was a domestic argument, dispute that he'd had, and so we ruled him out. As news filters back that this isn't their man, Grant Moyle learns the true extent of the victim's dreadful injuries. Andrew and Rosemary have fought with the killer from the front of the house through to the back. And I would suggest fought valiantly during the attack. Chantelle has suffered significant injuries. Chantelle was stabbed um, 33 times, Andrew 29, and Rosemary um, 50 or more. The intensity of the violence is hard to process, and more details will come to the fore. Just days after the triple murders, the team focus on people who could determine the family's last movements. Rosemary and Andrew had gone away down to Adelaide Saturday night to a party. Chantelle had had a party, and at that party, several friends had attended, and things had been going well. I understand it wasn't a, a, a big party by any stretch of the imagination, but more a case of some friends over, a few drinks, watching TV, watching movies. We went and followed up and found those friends and interviewed those. Now, all of them were, were helpful. We didn't have any issues with any of them. They told us what we wanted to, to know, gave us some access to Facebook sites to have a look and um, clarify some points and get some more background. We did that. The party is to provide South Australia police with vital links to Chantelle's partner and closest friends. We spoke to the majority of those on the Tuesday, so the second day. During that process, a uniform officer was speaking to one of the many friends that the name Jason Downey came up. Jason Downey is an 18-year-old Scottish teenager who emigrated to Kapunda with his mother and brother six years before. Having once attended the same school as Chantelle, he knows her and her boyfriend. A statement was taken from him that day. That is the first time his name came up, but uh, it came up no different from anyone else's at that particular time. Police are also keen to track the last movements of Chantelle's partner. Chantelle's boyfriend had sent her a text message at 5.30am on the Monday morning to her phone asking how she was because she'd been ill the day before. And he said he didn't receive a reply, but our inquiry showed that a return message was sent from that phone. But Chantelle was out of credit on her phone, so the message went off into ether space and we've never been able to retrieve it. But we know the reply was sent. It could not have been sent by Chantelle. It had to be sent uh, by the killer. And so we had a, uh, a look at um, Chantelle's boyfriend in regards to that. Was he telling us the truth? But we were able to rule him out. As Chantelle's boyfriend is eliminated as a suspect, four days on, Grant Moyle addresses the growing media. Well, obviously the offender is still outstanding and, uh, and I would suggest the offender or offenders are, uh, should be considered dangerous. Uh, if anyone does know who they are or has suspicions about individuals, please contact police immediately. 
and the forensics team discovers something crucial at the crime scene. The fingerprint um, specialists moved through the house to take fingerprints. They were spraying a substance called amino black that brings up fingerprints on different surfaces. And they were spraying that on the back of the bedroom door of Chantel's bedroom. And they were targeting a certain area and happened to pick up one fingerprint on the edge of the door. And that was quite detailed. This is potentially a significant breakthrough. A fingerprint that does not match the victims could narrow their search for a suspect. Obviously, we were hopeful that that would get an identification, and we got the word back the next day that, unfortunately, no, it wasn't on the national database. And so we had no match at that particular time. So that told us certainly, well, it certainly told us that it wasn't any of the Rowe family. The lack of a match on their system could simply mean the person has no criminal record. A frustrating result, but the officers press on. Meanwhile, friends, colleagues and residents continue to try and help with the investigation as the hunt for the cold-blooded killer intensifies. At the end of that first week, sadness overtook the gossip and the speculation. People started to realise that what we had here was just a tragedy of epic proportions, an innocent family who had been absolutely slaughtered for no discernible reason. Almost seven days after the multiple stabbings, residents still fear a killer is on the loose, and detectives are desperate to find the culprit, when forensic officers provide another potential breakthrough. On the 13th of November, we were advised that a DNA profile had been obtained from semen that was found on Chantel. And they had uh, loaded that to the uh, database and unfortunately uh, there was no match to it. Again, same with the fingerprint, uh, it's, it's great news but just not quite what we needed at that time. But. It certainly confirmed our thoughts that uh, most likely Chantel was the key to this investigation and the uh, relationships she had with other people. The team now realise that this sexually motivated attack could be central to the killer's intention and start to focus on people associated with Chantel. Who could have any compulsion to murder a 16-year-old girl and her parents? We had to then go about taking some samples from her male friends and to eliminate those of them having that DNA profile. As samples are collected, one of the statements taken from a friend sets alarm bells ringing. We were sitting in the uh, command post and John was reading one of the statements and said, oh, this, look at this, there's just something not quite right about that. He started to give an alibi when he wasn't asked for one. He made some comments about uh, not being invited to the party on the Saturday night, um, of not having a girlfriend, and really trying to come up with an alibi without being asked for one, trying to paint the picture. And we thought, yeah, um, uh, we'll do a, a bit more work on this. That included uh, ringing his place of employment to say, um, you know, um, what do you know about this individual? He was visited on uh, Sunday and a DNA sample and fingerprints were taken from him. A and he volunteered that without any problems. This young man is Jason Downey. He freely offers to help with inquiries, but officers also notice something unusual. Police officers had visited him and seen the cuts on his hands. Because of the nature of the attack inside the house, it would not be unusual for the offender to suffer some sort of injury as well. He said that he'd, uh, at the, the relevant times he was elsewhere. He was in Freeling, he was in Gawler, he was with another person. He had sustained the injuries to his left hand as a result of falling off a uh, push bike. With Downey's relaxed attitude and willingness to help, could the cuts be the result of a fall or something far more sinister? Officers have to wait less than 48 hours to find out.
At 9.30am on Tuesday morning, I got the phone call that the sample was a match to Downey. In the old mining town of Kapunda, just outside Adelaide, a vicious killer is yet to be caught. Almost one week after a family has been slain in their home, the investigation team has just received their biggest breakthrough so far. The sample was taken from Downey on the Sunday, and at 9.30am on Tuesday morning, I got the phone call that the sample was a match to Downey, which was um, uh, just fantastic for us. This is the turning point in the triple murder inquiry. The swab taken from Jason Downey matches DNA found on Chantel. I felt that then was the time to move. We couldn't wait any longer. We were on very, very good ground. And so we made the decision, uh, or made the decision that day, that we would arrest him that evening. This apparently unassuming 18-year-old has potentially broken into a family home and attacked three defenseless people with a knife, inflicting over 100 wounds. Officers realize they must take their next step with caution. We could march into his workplace and arrest him there, but there's other people that work there. He's a mechanic, he's in a workshop. What weapons or other things were there? If he ran off, what might be the consequences of that? If we went to his home to arrest him there, um, might he, uh, if his mother was home and other, there was another woman who lived there as well, uh, might he take them hostage? I didn't want to uh, alert him that we, were, uh, that we were about to take that step because we didn't want to uh, endanger anyone else. Officers set about planning a way to get to their number one suspect. We had asked a number of people to come in and sign their statements throughout this investigation. He had one there unsigned, so we decided we'd ask him, through his manager, to drop in on his way home and sign the statement. He was dropped off at the station and uh, informed he was under arrest. Armed with the DNA results of the testing of the semen and of the fingerprint, eight days on from the violent murder of Rose, Andrew and Chantel Rowe, South Australian police urgently question one teenager who might be the key to it all. With this powerful forensic evidence, what would Jason Downey reveal? He said that he'd had consensual intercourse with um, Chantel some months beforehand. It was explained to him that that couldn't account for the way we'd found the DNA sample, uh, but that seemed to just be dismissed by him. He offered an explanation that he had been at um, Chantel's boyfriend's place for a while, had left there and driven down to Gawler to McDonald's, had done a number of different things, visited different people, uh, and came back. He'd come back home, he'd had an argument with his mother, and his mother um, uh, locked him out of the house. So he had to sleep in the car that night and um, it was shortly after 11 p.m., as I understand it, that he was had that argument and was forced out of the house. Chantelle's boyfriend informed Jason that he wouldn't be staying over at Chantelle's house that night. She was ill. She wasn't going to be going to work the next day. She had a bit of a cold. Downey knew that he was not going to be there that night. But he came up with an excuse that he'd, uh, at the, the relevant times, he was elsewhere. He had sustained the injuries to his uh, left hand as a result of falling off a uh, push bike first and then later he told someone else it was falling off a motorbike. Downey's alibi isn't adding up and he has no real explanation for his DNA being found on one of the victim's bodies. As they press for more answers, detectives are keen to let Christopher Rowe know of the latest developments. As soon as um, Downey had been arrested, I went around to his home with our victim contact officer and uh, informed him that someone had been arrested and what charges were laid. As the slightly built teenager faces serious charges, Christopher Rowe now has to brace himself for seeing the alleged killer of his family 
in court. The Elizabeth Magistrates Court's interesting because it's home to a lot of low-level crime. I thought they'd brought up the wrong person. I thought they'd brought up some skinny little drug dealer that had been caught on a street corner selling meth to some kids. But no, that was him. I turned around and I looked at the faces of the family members of the Rose who had come to the court case, and I knew it was him. The hatred and malevolence and grief pouring out of their expressions told the whole story. They knew who he was, and already they had some sense of what was going on. Once that person was arrested for the crime, I think that's when the community started to get back to some type of normality. I mean, there's probably many that didn't, but I think, by and large, I think you know, most people thought, right, that's it. Jason Downey maintains his innocence during a number of appearances in court. It was supposed to be six weeks. It took over a year. Part of the reason it was blowing out was because the police were continuing their investigations. They wanted to make sure they had everything locked down tight. The other part was Downey himself. What we didn't know at the time was that Downey had started calling his mother and calling his brother from jail, writing them letters and talking about the fact that he didn't do it. The police had come across that correspondence with Downey's mother, with Downey's brother, where he blamed a man in the dark clothing with the green shopping bag, where he claimed, oh, I fucked up, Mum. I was in the house and I cradled Chantelle as she died, but I didn't do it and I should have told the cops I'm so sorry. From my understanding, what the police were trying to do was make sure they had DNA evidence locked down, they had fingerprint evidence locked down, footprint evidence, any circumstantial evidence that could put Jason at the house at that time talking to witnesses about his attitude, talking to people about his obsession with Chantel, scouring his Facebook page, his Bebo page, his internet usage for connections to Chantel, his text messages, his use of his phone, all of those pieces of evidence that would paint the picture of someone that would do anything to be in a romantic relationship with Chantel, to eliminate these ridiculous claims that he was making of a man wearing dark clothes carrying a green shopping bag running out of the house to counteract his claims of, I was there and Chantel died in my arms, but I didn't do the murder. Anything that could put those knives in his hands at those times. And that was a lot of pressure for them, and they had to get that locked down tight. Whilst trying to prove Downey's claims are false, South Australia police also uncover more damning evidence against him. What we did recover from the scene was a um, a digital camera um, on the um, kitchen table, I think it was. And uh, we examined that and found the photos of a um, family lunch that they'd had together, the Rose had had together on the Sunday afternoon. Those photos proved great evidence because Chantel was holding a USB stick at, uh, at that time. We were to find the USB stick in his bedroom at his home address and the lanyard to it in his vehicle, I believe. Uh, we also found um, some blood staining on the console of his car that was to be you know, Rosemary and Andrew Rose. We were able to determine through the examination of the laptop that there'd been a failed login on Chantel's laptop uh, sometime after she was murdered and that there was some blood staining on the keyboard but unfortunately not sufficient enough for us to get a DNA profile from. And the bloody fingerprint found on Chantel's door has finally come back as a match to Downey. More than one year on from the tragedy comes one of the biggest turning points in the case so far. He finally pleaded guilty. I think it came as quite a, a shock to the system. In one of the most horrific cases to hit South Australia, Jason Downey has been under the microscope as damning evidence links him to three of the most brutal murders ever witnessed in the country. It's something that I think everyone's going to um, have nightmares over for many years to come. Now, in a revelation, the suspected murderer, who has claimed his innocence all along, shocks the court. He finally pleaded guilty, and as, as it would transpire, that he pleaded guilty one year and one day after the actual crimes. 
On each occasion, uh, Christopher had attended and quite a number of the other um, relatives and friends had attended those court cases. It's very hard for all, both, both families to have um, lived with this moment. Um, we're all getting through it. Uh, we hope he gets what he deserves. It was a long process for them uh, and a traumatic process for them. Downey pleads guilty to the three murder charges. Shortly following the anniversary of the tragedy, the family and friends of the victims must now listen to the harrowing details coming out in court. When a person pleads guilty in a South Australian court, the role of the judge changes to a finder of fact because a judge must determine a penalty appropriate to that exact crime. The prosecution had no choice but to go through the evidence, and pardon the pun, blow by blow. And that was when everybody concerned with the case got an idea of just what had happened in that house that night. For the first time, the circumstances surrounding that horrific night are laid bare for all to hear. He gave an account through his um, lawyer uh, about what happened that night. I don't accept uh, everything that he said. Uh, he has certainly stood in the bath in the, uh, at some stage before the attacks have taken place because of the nature of the shoe print that was there. Whether he actually came in through that window or not, I'm not 100% convinced. But nonetheless, he certainly has been in there at some stage. He gave an account of Chantel being attacked first and then having to um, murder the, the parents as a result so that he wouldn't get found out. One of the knives from the Rowe family kitchen became involved and Andrew was stabbed in excess of 20 times. He was stabbed so many times and with such force that pieces of the knife broke off in his body. There was then a confrontation, according to the court's accepted version of events, with Rose. And again, another knife was introduced. She was stabbed multiple times. She would go on to be stabbed in excess of 50 times by the time that the murder had concluded, but this was sadly the first set of stabbings for her. After they fell, the court ruled that Downey moved into the bedroom. The poor girl was underneath her bed bleeding um, from what's been described as a free flowing wound and has been dragged back out from under the bed and, and, and further attacked. placed her on top of the bed. He then continued to stab her. In the end, it was 33 different wounds. Then stripped her of her clothing, redressed her, left her on the bed. After a frenzied and prolonged attack, Downey feebly attempts to cover his tracks and then decides to continue his merciless rampage. The thing that has always struck me the most about this is that at least two members of that family knew someone they loved was being murdered while they were there. And she died having listened to both of her parents be killed and then undergoing that insidious torture herself. It, it just defies belief. After an initial attack, um, he has attempted to clean up some of the crime scene and, he, and he's attacked them again. And we know that by the nature of the crime scene. He tried to mop around Andrew and paused to stab him several more times. It's believed that he then noticed that Rose was still alive and was trying to make her way to the door. And he proceeded to deliver the last of the 55 stab wounds that she would receive until she was dead. At that point, Jason gave up on trying to clean up and left bloody sock prints as he ran out of the house. Nobody saw him leave. All that anybody heard was Rose screaming help three times and a noise like something falling over. Prior to him being sentenced, he, through his solicitor, 
um, gave directions on where the shoes he was wearing could be found and uh, it was the local police officer who followed those directions and eventually found them, and that which wasn't far from the um, murder scene. Then he tried to give directions on where he'd hidden his clothing, the weapons, um, and some uh, clean-up items because he cleaned up and took those items with him. Uh, we took him out of custody um, just before he was sentenced and spent a day travelling around that area. We were only ever able to recover uh, some clothing of his. We never found the knives. This detailed account of the level of violence has to be released for the court to hear. Family and friends also have to endure information about Downey's unbelievable actions after he has murdered Andrew, Rose and Chantel. He's never shown any uh, remorse throughout this whole process. I mean, if you look at his actions after the murder, the night, he's left the scene, he's gone off, he's disposed of his shoes, he's disposed of some clothing. He slept in his car that night. He's attended work the next day, albeit slightly late. Pretended he didn't know anything about it until supposedly hearing it on the news that afternoon, then feigning grief having to go home early and then not being able to work the next day because of his grief. And the cover-up doesn't stop there. Downey is also filmed attempting to show his alleged grief in a very public manner. He's laid a um, card and teddy bear at the back gate of the house where a lot of people laid uh, tributes. And he's just played the uh, normal um, a local um, in grief about what has happened. He is a way of people paying him attention, but I've got an excuse that I can go with to get me out of it so that you don't think really that I'm the killer, but maybe you'll talk about me a little more. Buy a little grey teddy bear, one of the Friends Forever brand, take it, stop, pause, look longingly at the memorial, make sure you know that the camera's filming you at that point. It's like out of a movie scene. He was composing this in his head. That was his dramatic moment, and he was taking full advantage of it. But also it's an excuse, because if I went back there and left a memorial, clearly I didn't do it. He's mixed with these people during that whole week, even uh, with Chantel's boyfriend. I just don't know how he could do that. This window into Downey's psyche is also evident from stories of his behavior whilst in custody. He considered himself the big man. Chest puffed up, walking around. I did the Kapunda triple murders. I did those killings. That was me. I was in court today. Big noting himself. Now, I'm sure some of that was fear because, again, 52 kilograms in a South Australian prison filled with pedophiles, bikers and killers, you'd want to be looking out for yourself very quickly. The family was stealing themselves for a long trial. So were the police and so were the media. After a gruelling process lasting more than a year, with all the facts scrutinised, the judge finally delivers his long-awaited sentencing in one of the biggest criminal cases to hit South Australia. He calculated that Downey deserved a sentence of 35 years one of the highest in South Australian history. Downey barely reacted again. It wasn't that he didn't care, I think he just didn't understand. I don't think he has the intelligence needed and the insight needed to understand how long 35 years really is. That it's longer again than he's been alive. And that when 35 years expires, he's not necessarily going to get out. For closure for the family and everything else, it needs to be and uh, he was obviously guilty. There's no question in my mind about that. The sentence provokes an emotional reaction from the victim's family. Please explain to me the justice in this. This is not a justifiable offence. He cannot return my family to me, so why should he have the right to any definition of life? He pleaded guilty on this occasion and strung it out as long as he could because he knew it, 
the, the evidence against him was overwhelming. Not because he felt bad for what he did, but he knew what's the point now. If I plead guilty now, I'll get a discount to some degree, which he did. As the family tried to process the outcome of the sentence, Sean Fuster learns of another rumour that threatens to cause even more pain. My editor said to me, Sean, was Chantel pregnant? No. Was it ever suggested she was pregnant? No, not in court. There was a rumour way back at the very beginning, an ugly rumour, but the cops knocked that down within the first week, boss, why? The newspaper just splashed all over their website that she was killed and she was pregnant. I couldn't believe it. I thought, this family has dealt with enough. And I went tracking down the stringer that had written it. And I said to him, where do you get off? It's been publicly knocked down. It wasn't mentioned once in court. How could you possibly attach that? Oh, well, I thought it would be interesting. What I said to him next is unrepeatable. It's undoubtable that Jason Downey is extremely immature. He was raised with no male perspective on his life, no father figure. He had a stepfather, but that was much later in life, after he and his mother and brother moved to Australia from Scotland, leaving his older sister behind. As Downey begins his sentence of more than three decades without his freedom, he decides to write a letter attempting to apologise for his crimes. The biggest sign of Jason's immaturity was the letter that he wrote, which to my mind is the single most inexplicably inadequate apology that's ever been committed to paper. It's juvenile, the handwriting is juvenile. There are loops for eyes, there are missing words, there are random capitalizations, there are spelling mistakes all through it. And he apologizes for my recent actions and how sad he is that he no longer has a car and a career. There's no perspective, there's no insight. He may very well be sorry in a limited way, but he doesn't understand fully what he's done. Just that incredibly blinkered, narrow understanding of what he's done and the tragedy that he's perpetrated. I think, you know, in, in due respect, there's a lot of hurt out there that we didn't know about. A lot of people probably grieving a lot more than we suspect and probably still are. Uh, and that's why we have this ongoing you know, respect and, and uh, we're careful in, in, in how we you know, go about talking to anybody in relation to it now. The lives of Chantal, Rose and Andrew Rowe have been taken in the most cowardly and unimaginable way. The murderer is to serve the majority of his adult life in prison. But for those left behind, the main question still lingers. Why did Downey go to the lengths of killing a mother, father, and their young daughter? His goal was to have Chantel, whether that was emotionally, whether it was physically, whatever it took. Being confronted by Andrew, probably being told something along the lines of, get out, you little freak, or what the hell are you doing in my house? Being questioned caused the snap. I don't think. This was premeditated in the sense that he went there with the intent to kill, but he was prepared to do whatever it took to make Chantel his that night, up to and including murder in a way that he hadn't prepared for, consciously, but something in him was clearly prepared to do. His lawyer said to the court, I can't give your honor an explanation for what happened. My client doesn't remember it. He snapped into a fuge state and the court has to ask itself how a person of his size, of his nature, with no criminal record, could possibly do something like this. The prosecution had a very easy answer for it. It's very simple, Your Honour, he's a liar. He's a liar and he's a coward and he's a vicious brute. That's it. The motive's as old as time itself, simple jealousy, and he snapped. 